We look forward to the time when there is no Shabbat Shalom to all of you, and thank you for joining me again today for the third part of Parasha Yitro, which is uh, <clears throat> a three-part series for this weekend. Parasha Yitro is the Parasha Jethro, who is Moshe's or Moses' father-in-law. And if you remember, in this part of the Parasha, in this Parasha for the uh, <clears throat> different Torah portions, this is the part where Moses is at Mount Sinai with the Israelites, and this is where he receives the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> so this part is very interesting. It's called Moshe's or Moses' Efficiency Crisis, and the real lesson of Yitro's or Jethro's leadership advice. So this ought to be very interesting. And soon after Moshe, or Moses, and his father-in-law, Yitro, reunite, Yitro gets a chance to observe the way Moshe, Moses, runs things in the Israelite camp. Now, he isn't exactly impressed with the way Moshe handles the people's legal disputes, okay? Uh, he's even kind of upset with the fact that Moshe wasn't even able to come to uh, Yitro's uh, <clears throat> little uh, celebration party where he broke bread and ate with the leaders and even Aaron to celebrate the Israelites being set free from captivity. So Moshe right now is the only judge spending all of his time from morning to night hearing the claims and forcing hundreds of people to wait for uh, hours for a chance to be heard. So Yitro offers an alternative advice. He says, appoint other judges as leaders. Let them handle the small things. Well, of course, of course Moses, Moshe deals with the biggest of the issues, okay, that which can't be handled on the lower levels, kind of like what should happen in the courts of the United States and Europe, where you have the smaller, lower level courts, but it, if it doesn't get resolved, you can go all the way to the Supreme Court. So, <clears throat> in the story in the Torah, or is this story in the Torah just to simply teach us about the importance of efficiency? Maybe so. But if that's all it is, then why are there three strange echoes, or why are there strange echoes in the story of the creation of Eve, all the way at the beginning of the Bible? So join us as we explore the reason God decided man needed a partner, and how this can relate to Yitro's leadership advice to Moshe, Moses, and also to us. So my name is Rabbi Halal Clint Fry, and I welcome you to this week's Parasha Yitro. Now, you know that the classic stereotype about in-laws, okay, mother-in-laws, father-in-laws, try as you might, you can never quite escape their disapproval. They're always saying something negative, right? You're running your own successful business. Oh, that's wonderful. But you know, no one's really heard of you. <laughs> Timmy, you know, your son, he won the science fair. He's so brilliant. But why aren't you sending him for piano lessons? There's always something. They want more out of you. Okay, so uh, happily for me, that hasn't happened, but I'm not sure Moses 
uh, Moshe was so blessed. The relationship between Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro, Yitro. So if we can picture this, the word is spreading about the 10 plagues, the split sea, the great victory over the Amalek. Moshe's father-in-law, Yitro, hears about all of it and sets out to reunite with his son-in-law in the wilderness. He arrives, <coughs> his family's with him. The oohs and ahs has, uh, at all the stories they hear, right? They're like, wow, man, that's awesome. But then the other shoe drops. His second day in the camp, he sees Moshe sitting by himself, standing by himself, surrounded by crowds of people trying to help resolve their disputes. He's not very impressed. And he tells Moshe, okay, what you're doing is just not good. You'll be completely overwhelmed. You're going to get so tired doing this. I mean, that's normal for all of us. We get tired, right? So what you're doing is too heavy for you to bear. You can't do it by yourself. And of course, he has the solution. Teach everyone the laws. Then find some high-quality people, decent, honest, fair people, and appoint them as lower court judges. People who fear the Lord, who aren't out for uh, money gain, etc., etc. That way, my son, you can have a sustainable system for helping the people of yours with their legal manners, and everyone should be happy, okay? Except me. I'm not happy because this story kind of confuses me, okay? Because if you can understand Yitro's leadership advice to Moshe to appoint judges, what is the Torah trying to teach us here? that we shouldn't take on too many responsibilities and we might want to consider delegating every now and then. <clears throat> so that's not always easy to do. I know I like to be in control of things and many people do. So that's useful advice for those of us looking to be more productive. So is making good lists, proper diet, exercise, a healthy balance of work time and me time, family time, but the Torah does not devote chapters to all of these. It doesn't need to. There should be common sense. So then why is the story, which need, seems to be about nothing more than common sense efficiency, even in the Bible, in the Torah? <clears throat> well, I think there are actually some clues in the text that signal that there's something deeper going on here. For instance, look at the very beginning of Yitro's critique. This thing you're doing is not good. Does that remind you of anything, people? Maybe way back, at the, way back at the beginning of Genesis, God actually says in the Garden of Eden story, right after creating man, it is not good for man to be by himself. Now, this is very interesting. Now, we can grant it that it does not sound much like such a unique phrase. So it doesn't really prove that, that there's a connection between the two stories. But if you think about it, aren't the, um, the times when God says it's not good really describing the same problem? In both cases, someone is all alone who shouldn't be. Adam has no one with him in the garden, and Moshe has no one with him to judge. So, and the problem, the fact that they're all alone, is actually described with the same word, laved. Okay, God declares. It is not good for the man to be by himself, Laved. Okay, and Yitro declares <clears throat> the same thing. This thing you're doing is not good. You cannot do it by yourself. You're both, they're both alone, and it's a problem, which is not good. Now, is there anything else that links these two stories together? I personally think there are. So let's go past the problems and look at the solutions. God and Jethro both say the way to fix the problem of being alone is by adding partners. This could even be added in our day of age, okay? Business partners. Sometimes we can do a business by ourselves, but sometimes it's best to have partners who can help us share the load, okay? Maybe even financially. We get to a point where we can't take care of the business by ourselves. Financially, we need other people to help us out, okay? Adam needs a partner. Moshe needs partners. <clears throat> he needs people to help him judge. So there are connections to Yitro's and Moshe's story in the Bible. Okay. Now you might say that can't really count as an additional parallel between these stories. The solution to being alone has to involve getting some sort of partner. 
And I can agree with that. But there are other links between the solutions, okay? For instance, do you remember how Adam and Moshe got their partners? Let's start with Adam. How does he end up with Eve? After God declares Adam needs a partner, the Torah says, God formed from the earth all of the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And then Adam had to play this strange dating game to see if he could find a partner from among the animals. That's a little strange, I have to say. But in the end, <laughs> he could not find a partner. Hey, I can't talk to the dog, the cat, the rabbit, the lion, whatever. They don't answer me. They're just there. Okay? And that's when God stepped in and created Eve. In other words, God didn't just create Adam's perfect partner right away. Adam had to search. He had to go searching through all the other uh, life on earth first. <clears throat> Obviously not the fish, but the animals on the land. And what about Moshe? Was it the same thing for him? Didn't he have to search for his partner judges? Yes, he did. Yitro tells him, look through the nation and find among them various people. In other words, Moshe needs to go through the Israelites to find his helpers. He needs to search. Okay, not just finding, hey, you, come here. No, he needs to find good, God-fearing men, men who are not prone to being uh, out there in it for the money to swindle people out of their money, uh, who are um, wise. So here's a, a prerequisite for these people that he needs to look for. So it's not just that Adam and Moshe both need partners. They also both needed to search for them. Now here is one more connection between the two. What's the point of the partners in each story? In Moshe's case, the role of the lower court judges is to help him to shoulder some of the burden of judging a nation. <clears throat> and is the same true of Adam and Eve? No, not really. So Adam doesn't have to settle any disputes or judge anybody. The reason he needs a partner seems fundamentally different from Moshe's. Okay, he needs a companion, someone he can complete and be completed by. All right. So yet yeah, fascinatingly, the Torah describes Adam's partner as a edzer, a helper. Okay, someone to assist him with something. With what? I don't know, but something, okay? Picking fruit. Somebody to just spend the day with, all right? There wasn't a whole lot to decide back then. Should we go jump in the water and take a bath? Or should we go and lay under that tree and eat its fruit or that one? I don't know. So we have one more parallel. The function of the partners in both stories, surprising as it seems, is to be simply a helper, okay? So Adam and Moshe are both in a situation that is deemed as lehev, not good, because they are both laved, alone. So they are both told to search for partners, and when they find them, their partners are somehow meant to serve as helper, helpers for them. This seems at least to me like a very compelling list of connections. What do they mean exactly, though? What are their parallels trying, parallels trying to tell us? What could Adam need for a wife possibly have to do with Moshe's need for colleagues? All right, whatever these parallels mean, can they tell us anything about why Yitro's story is in the Torah? So now we need to go into the backstory behind Yitro's or Jethro's management advice to Moshe, Moses. To answer this, let's try to understand that last surprising connection that we pointed out. Moshe and Adam both need partners to help them. That makes sense for Moshe, but what did Adam need any help with? Like I said, what did he do? Just somebody maybe to climb on his shoulders to uh, maybe get some fruit from the upper part of the trees? I don't know. But if you stopped anyone on the street and asked them why God thought man needed a partner, they probably would have said that he would have been lonely otherwise. So, that's what the text says, he was all alone. I can imagine just being surrounded by animals, not having anybody to talk to except God, when he comes to visit, might get pretty boring, right? Uh, so, that's my suggestion. And that's not all the text says. Look at how God describes Adam's projected partner. Okay, 
a helper opposite him. Because in Hebrew, it's Adzer Chenedev, uh, which is a helper opposite. Not a Isha, or a woman, or an Ahava, which is beloved, or a Rea, who is a friend. Okay, these are all different ways to describe different types of partners. All of which would be better terms to describe someone who might think your loneliness. Instead, she's simply described as a partner. Okay, someone opposite of him. We've often heard, oftentimes, that opposites attract, for example. My wife can be completely opposite of me in some areas, and I need that because if I have somebody who's the same as me, we're going to do the same dumb things. We're going to make the same mistakes. She can help balance me out, and I can help balance her out. Okay, so, uh, so maybe we got it wrong. I don't know. Maybe the issue with man being alone isn't loneliness. Maybe, they, maybe there was something else not good about man being alone, something he needed to accomplish that he needed help with. I don't know. But what could this mysterious task of Adam's possibly be? It seems like all he was supposed to do was eat the fruit of the garden, lay around, do whatever he wanted. So did he need a helper so he could stand on her shoulders, like I said, or her? Her stand on his shoulders when the apple he wanted was too high up to reach? Did he need a second opinion about whether the tomatoes were ripe or not ripe? What did Adam have to do that was so hard that it was not good for him to have to do it by himself? <laughs> this is an interesting thing to think about. I think the text may actually tell us the answer. When God declares it's not good for man to be alone, does God just decide that in a vacuum? Or does something precipitate that? Is there something that happens that makes it a problem for men to be alone? So let's take a look. Right before God decides to give man a helper, he tells him to eat from the fruits of the garden, with one exception, of course, as we know, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat from it. <clears throat> so, for on that day you eat from it, you shall die. And the very next words are, uh, Verse God says, Adam, stay away from the tree of knowledge. It can kill you. Right after God says, hey, you know what? Adam really shouldn't be alone. He needs help. Well, that doesn't seem to suggest that the reason man needed a helper was to help him avoid eating from the tree, maybe. I know it seems a little kind of strange the thing to suggest. After all, look how things did turn out. His helper ended up being the first one to eat the fruit. The exact opposite happened. Adam's partner actually fed him the forbidden fruit, but the text really does seem to be pushing us in this direction. Okay, so Adam's, uh, <clears throat> the one who's opposite of him, is meant to help him avoid eating from the tree of knowledge, but how? I mean, what is she expected to do? God didn't decide to create a bouncer to stand guard over the forbidden tree. Maybe it would have been a better thing if he put little angels around it with swords in the very beginning. He simply created a second human being, is a partner by simply existing somehow supposed to help man resist the tree? I think so. It's a possibility based on an idea I've heard around the, about what exactly the tree of knowledge was. Here's how I understood what he said. All throughout the beginning of Genesis, God is creating things and then calling them how. Good. This is good. Good, and that makes sense because when you're in charge of something, when you're the CEO or an author, or an architect, it's your job to decide what's good, what's bad, what matches your vision for how things ought to be, and what doesn't. All right, uh, and that's what it means to know how good and re, okay, resh, evil. It's not so much knowledge as it is the perspective that I am the master. That I am in a position to decide whether things are how they ought to be or not. And even though in our own small human way, we hear, uh, we wear the hat sometimes, ultimately in terms of the big picture, the hat belongs to God. He is the true master. <clears throat> he is the one who decided how things should be, what is good and what isn't. This world is his world. We are meant to recognize that it's his decisions how things ought to be. We are not supposed to uh, claim knowledge 
of good and evil for ourselves. All right? So we're supposed to leave that fruit on the tree, just as he said. That's it. No other thing to think about. Now, let me ask you one thing. What kind of person do you think would have had the hardest time resisting the tree of knowledge? What might make it hard for someone to recognize there's a higher power above? Well, I can think of two things that might contribute to that. The first is power. Yep. If you really don't hold that much power or authority, if you're usually the one at the bottom, the life itself reinforces the fact that there's something above you or someone. But if you're at the top of the pyramid, if you have the power over others, then you don't have that benefit of the natural check on your perspective. And that can make it easy to believe you are at the top. The second thing is solitude. Because even if you have power, if that power is shared with others, that also forces you to realize you're not the master. You can't pretend you're the head honcho, the big guy, if, say, you're a senator or a board member, and dozens of people are just as powerful as you. Now, if it's just you at the top as a president or CEO, or you're given the authority expected to lead, and people comply with everything you say, then all your life experiences are pushing you to think of yourself as the final arbiter of right and wrong, the final decider of right and wrong. Wouldn't that make it hard to remember that there's a moral code to which you're, uh, you are being held to? And I think the headlines confirm it. They're filled with powerful, solitary figures who've managed to convince themselves that they're entitled to anything and everything. Okay, we can say many times in history and even now, okay, we can think of certain leaders in the world who are power crazy and they think they're the only ones in charge. Perhaps that's why a partner was deemed necessary for Adam to have a chance at avoiding the tree of knowledge, because without a partner alone in the garden, without an equal, free to eat almost anything he wanted, how long could Adam be expected to follow these rules? But with her presence to remind Adam he was not unique, that he wasn't the master, Eve, at least in theory, gave Adam a chance. That was the hope. Now, let's bring this all back to Moshe and Jethro. Yitro. I think we're in a position to understand what these parallels are trying to teach us. The meaning behind Yitro's advice to appoint leaders. What is it? So on the surface, Adam and Moshe face uh, two very different struggles. Moshe seems to be dealing with an efficiency problem. He's overburdened and needs to be distribute some of the labor of judging to other people. Adam seems to be dealing with the problem of resisting the lure of the tree of knowledge, maybe. God knows. He's the one that created him. But maybe underneath the surface, these struggles are not so different. Okay. We can think about Moshe's situation. He was in a position of great power over the Israelites. He was doing it all alone. Power and solitude. Kind of a recipe for disaster. If not for anybody else, for him. Okay, he's going to be burnt out, and then we won't have an efficient leader anymore. So perhaps, despite the very different circumstances, Moshe was at risk of eating from the tree of knowledge in a way, as, such, as much as Adam had been. So he was on the path to believing he was a master over the Israelites, possibly. Not just the one to explain good and evil, but to actually decide it. Yeah, he could make his own rules. Ah. I'll decide what's important here now. That can happen to any of us, to anybody on the face of this earth. In fact, more likely than not, it will happen, if not kept in check. So, perhaps the reason that the Torah tells the story of Yitro the way it does is to direct our attention to Adam, to tell us the deeper issues in both stories are one and the same. No matter how great a man is, no matter how he ends up justifying it to himself, if he holds power and holds it alone, he will face the delusion that his power, his authority, is greater than it truly is. Okay. <clears throat> An essential, essential, very important way to combat this delusion is to have a real partner. In Adam's case, case Eve, another human, and in Moshe's case, moral partners, people who wouldn't be swayed by the convenience or gain, who would deal with all people, Moshe included, with honesty and integrity. In the end, did we arrive at a lesson 
all that different from don't do everything by yourself? Maybe not. But the reason is the real lesson. It's not about efficiency or sustainability. It's about the effect of being alone. The more often others rely on us or we rely on ourselves to make important decisions, the more trust we develop for our own intuitions, the more likely we are to come to overtrust in them and to believe we are greater than we are. But if we surround ourselves with people we can respect, people who are God-fearing, people who can keep us humble and honest, who won't just tell us what we want to hear, if we acquire the right kinds of partners for ourselves, then we can be the right kind of partners with God. So may you remember this, may we all remember this as we go through life. Thank you for joining us today, and may you have a blessed week. Thank you. Now for the ironic blessing, adesso la benedizione di Aroni. Yevarechecha Adonai Veishmarecha, Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vihuneka, Yesa Adonai Panavalecha Vyesem Lecha Shalom, Veshem Yeshua Hamashiach, Sarha Shalom Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom. Che il Signore vi benedica e vi protegga. Il Signore faccia risplendere il suo volto su di voi e vi sia propizio. Che il Signore elevi il suo volto su di voi e vi dia la pace. In nome di Yeshua, Gesù, il Messia, il Principe della Pace, Shalom. bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.